Jessica De Silva and Louise Guzman. Gonzalez. Gonzalez. Um, Sigflup has been an Australian Labour Party member of the Australian Senate, representing the state of Tasmania since August 2000. She comes from a family with a long labour tradition. Her grandmother was a founding member of the Hobart branch of the ALP, and her late uncle was a Tasmanian state ALP president. Louise Gonzalez is a Haitian... I don't even know what this says. <laughs> Agronomist? And founder of an environmental peasant movement. He received the Goldman Environmental Prize in 2005 for his work on forest protection. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, thanks for coming. This is the last presentation. I'm glad you're coming and after this we can all breathe a big sigh of relief and wait for block party. Uh, so, let me start a video. Hopefully it doesn't wig out on the, the size, but we'll see. First, hopefully. Hey, nerd! Tired of playing with that old, dumb, 8 bit console? Uh-huh. We'll try putting some attitude into your console, dude! Sega Genesis with its 16-bit graphics and blast processing is here to show the other consoles who's boss. Sorry guys, but you can't do this on Nintendo. What? Genesis does what Nintendo does. All right, round of applause for the Sega Genesis. How many, uh, how many of you had this console uh, growing up? How many of you played the Sega Genesis? Can I see some hands? A good number of people, maybe 70% of people in the room. Anyone have the console now? Cool, we have a couple over there and one over here. Um, does anyone have a flash cart or something? Does anyone play ROMs on their, their Sega Genesis? I'm sorry? You saw your ex oh, I see what you're saying. So it's kind of like a prize sort of treasure. She collects antique consoles. That's kind of an interesting concept. I don't know, like, my thing with, with Sega Genesis and a lot of uh, newer, a lot of people collect antique consoles, but uh, a lot of things are emulated, you know? So you have run things on an emulator, and so you're, you want to play a ROM, you download a ROM and you play it on an emulator. You don't burn it to, uh, you don't write it to a, a Flash or a ROM or anything like that and play it on a Sega Genesis. No one really does that. So you're, the hardware becomes an emulator. Uh, an emulator is in real hardware. It's in representation of what someone's opinion of what the hardware is. But that's what everyone runs. Then you have other emulators that are written and when they write the emulators, I wrote a Nintendo emulator and this is what I did. I looked to other emulators to write it. And so I wrote it based on other emulators and it becomes this bizarre incestual sort of thing. Like that commercial isn't a Sega Genesis commercial. I found that on YouTube. And so it's, it's like someone representing as they would in an emulator uh, this Sega Genesis, whether it be its marketing or its commercials or or the actual hardware with something else. It's kind of a, a funny concept, and kind of a concept that you have to look out for when you start to program the Sega Genesis because you may find that something will work in an emulator, it won't work on a Sega. Something will work in one emulator, it won't work, work in another emulator. We're all talking about something that's supposed to be static, right? But it's not, because no, no one uses emulators. I don't know, I think it's kind of a, kind of a weird concept, but. We're gonna skip the, 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 we're just gonna go straight to the hardware pretty much and just talk about that on an emulator. Let me ex Randar this back, because I figured it would do that.
So this is psychogenesis. It looks complicated as fuck. And maybe if you took it and smashed it on the ground, this is what it would look like. But uh, you got your cartridge here, you got your controller, and your television. And you got like three main sort of areas that you can sort of make out there. Uh, the two of them are processors. We have two processors in the Sega Genesis, the 68K, the 68000. I like to say 68K. So whenever I say that, I mean the 68000. It's a 16 bits uh, processor with a lot of 32 bit instructions, uh, 16 bits data bus, um, just an overall pretty lead processor. Then we got the Z80, which is kind of a 16 bit processor too, 8 bit uh, data bus, a lot of 16-bit uh, registers and, and things like that. Uh, this is the 68K, this is the Z80. And then finally got this little guy here. Uh, this is the VDP, or the Video Display Processor, uh, which draws everything, that's why it's attached to the TV there. So every device here has memory associated with it. And uh, we're representing the memory in sort of a linear graph, uh, Y being highest ad uh, lowest address to High Y being the highest address, it's a memory map. And so we have two main memory maps, one for the Z80, uh, one for the 68K. And they are connected. So this is the 68K, as you can see by these squiggly lines here, it's connected to the Z80 memory. And it's a direct map to the memory. There's an area in the 68K memory that if you write to it, you're addressing Z80 memory. Uh, you have to do funky things to do that, but basically that's what you do. And then you got VDP over here with three different memories. And the way you communicate to it is through registers. And the registers are represented in the 68K's memory uh, through a couple of addresses. Uh, one for control, one for data. Uh, let me pull up some uh, bigger picture of the, of the 68K. And maybe you can see that in a little more detail. This is the 68K. I don't know if you remember the picture, but the top here was connected to Power Rangers. Not a cartridge I played, but a cartridge that is pretty big nonetheless. It could be as big as four megabytes. We have zero uh, through this address here is where the ROM is mapped onto the 68K. And for all intents and purposes, that's where the program starts. Uh, at the beginning of the memory, there's an interrupt table. And in that interrupt table, you are pointed to where to start. And it doesn't really work that way in hardware, because it actually runs a ROM, which checks to see if the word Sega is in a certain place in that ROM, so that if you change that, you violate some law that they can enforce. Uh, some sort of trademark violation or something like that. So that's kind of how they, it's not a technological sort of uh, anti, this does not have the seal of quality control. But, uh, well, the Nintendo, just sidetracking a little bit, the Nintendo, so I heard this earlier from the guy who melts chips. <laughs> Maybe he saw his, his, uh, his thing, but he's talking about how some of the, um, some of the unsupported cartridges like Bible Adventures for the Nintendo. The Nintendo had a little tiny 4-bit processor, like a microcontroller, one cartridge, one of the cartridge, one of the Nintendo talking to each other uh, to negotiate, let's start the fucking thing because you're a legitimate cartridge. While the unlegitimate cartridges, like Bible Adventures, said fuck that and blew the chip up inside the Sega. Uh, some voltage something or something, I don't know the details of it, but I thought that was particularly clever. It's not like that in the Sega Genesis. You just look for Sega, and then they, your little lawyers sick after you if, if you violate that. I don't know what it is nowadays, but whatever. Uh, blue areas, we don't use. We don't use a lot of areas. Actually, we, you can use a lot of areas, but I don't use a lot of areas, so I'm not going to care about them too much. This area right here is where the Z80 is mapped. You have the squigglies going down to the Z80. After that, we have a uh, a little area here, which I didn't represent with numbers, unfortunately, that is mapped to the controller. This little squiggly goes down to the controller. And this is a similar interface as this, where you have registers that you write to. It's a little bit different. Uh, nothing. Then you got this sweet little area. That's where those two addresses are. Well, those eight addresses, but one's 32-bit, one's 16-bit. So I guess 
not all eight addresses, but whatever, that's where those two things are. Then he got 64K of RAM, which he can pretty much do anything with right here. The RAM is mirrored, and everything's mirrored in the blue area, and there's all sorts of funky shit going on in the blue area that you can take advantage of if you want to, uh, but we don't have much time here. And that says, that's the end of memory, right there. I don't know, this little cut off there. So let's talk about the Z80. Well, no, no, I'll talk about the VDP with this squiggly, since it goes up there. <laughs> All right, so this is the VDP. This is where the squiggly comes in. And uh, again, we talk to the VDP through registers. Um, the VDP has three areas of memory, all of which are entirely used and have no real map. These definitely have no map. They just serve one purpose. Uh, VSRAM controls scrolling up and scrolling down. Uh, cram versus kind of like saying I say cram all the time and no one knows what I'm talking about controls the colors. You can have 64 colors. Raise your hand here. Who likes colors? Oh, it's the entire crowd. <laughs> you don't like colors at all back there. I gotta, are you maybe colorblind? Uh, never mind. This is a don't want to offend anyone here. Colorblind has 64 colors uh, from a palette of 512. It's 9 bit, 3 bit associated with RGB. Uh, so that's what's stored in cram. It's stored in kind of a funky way where it's not one after another. There's a gap there. I'm not going to talk about that, but it's not mapped as you would think it would be. Just keep that in mind. Uh, think and it with E a lot. That's it. <laughs> so if you ever do it, just and it with E a lot. You'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. Then this serves a number of purposes. It's VRAM. It is 64K like the actual RAM. Uh, it serves these purposes. These aren't mapped anywhere. They're controlled with registers, which you set uh, using the 68K, using those two addresses. You have scroll A, scroll B, window, H scroll, and sprite, uh, the sprite ad ad attribute table. Uh, scroll A and window are connected. I'll talk about scroll A. Uh, scroll A is a plane of eight by eight uh, pixels uh, that form a sprite. This is what we talk about when we talk about sprites. We have this two-dimensional array of pixels, and that's a sprite. So you have uh, a number of sprites. They can be a number of variables long and a number of variables uh, high that compose a two-dimensional array of these sprites, and that's called a map. Uh, think characters on a screen. You can have characters next to each other, and if you think of every character, A, S, S, H, O, L, E, being individual sprites, um, that's pretty much how you'd think of it. So, <laughs> yeah, so if, you're, if your terminal is 80 by 25, that's 80 by 25 sprites. Uh, for the Sega Genesis, you can have terminals of 32 by 32, uh, 64 by 32, 128 by 32, and then 32, 64, 128. But you got to be careful to not exceed the barrier of VRAM. You can't have 128 sprites by 128 sprites because you can't store that in there without clobbering all the other shit. So, Windows is the same thing. Um, but Window and Scroll A are connected together in a very special way because you can have registers in the VDP which, uh, based on different areas in the screen where you're, where you're drawing, can replace all subsequent drawings of pixels with what's in window. It becomes like this window that you can show. And I'm not going to talk about window either uh, any further, because I don't really use it, and I haven't really seen too many games that do. You can use it, but uh, we haven't gotten that far. Scroll B is the same thing, doesn't have a window associated with it. H scroll is an area of memory that s controls uh, the horizontal scroll of every line or every eight lines, or the entire screen. You have three different modes to do this. And uh, you select those modes with a register. VSRAM is the same thing, but or vertically. You can select the entire screen, or every two 16-bit uh, pixels, every two, every two patterns, excuse me there. And the reason for that limitation is uh, VSRAM is only 80 bytes long, and you can't have every line because that won't fit there. So let's talk about the Z80. And if you can't see, this squiggly goes to a TV because it's connected to a TV.
that's the Z80. Uh, this is the picture I made last, so it looks a little bit different, but uh, it has this little area here, and I should have labeled it with the other one. But uh, this is the map. It's similar to the 68K in the sense that everything's pretty much static. You have memory at the beginning. That's where it starts. There is no real intra table of sorts that it starts from. It just starts from zero. And uh, you got to look out for that. It kinda, I thought it started at 38. So it starts at zero. Um, this little area here represents these. And these are connected to the sound chip. I'm going to be talking about video. And my friend Lewis here is going to be talking about sound. And we're going to try and do half and half here. So I'll leave those a little bit to him. I'm going to talk about the bank switcher a little bit, though, because the bank switcher is a special area in memory where you store, uh, where you store nine bits sequentially, one after another. Those nine bits become upper bits to where this area of memory, the 68K bank, uh, is in the 68K. And that's 32 kilobytes, that little, that's half of the Z80 memory, that little area there. And you can do a ch -ch 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 and put the upper bits and have that be associated with any area in the 68K you see fit. Uh, that maybe does not include ROM. I've done some tests, and I can't, I've, there's documentation that says you can do it in ROM, but I can't get it to do it in ROM. So not exactly sure what's going there. We can easily do it in RAM and everything else, and you definitely can't do it on itself and have this infinite mem memory loop that explodes your, your Sega Genesis like it does to the Nintendo in every commercial you see. Um, so let's talk about the registers. These are the registers of the 60, of the, VDP. This is my ASCII PowerPoint presentation here. I should have uh, I should have explained that. Okay, I showed you two um, two areas of memory that you can write to in order to uh, control uh, registers. You can do a number of different things with those two registers, uh, with those two addresses, not control registers alone. You can do DMA transfers from VSRAM to VRAM to CRAM to VRAM. You can copy between them. You can do it from 68K RAM to VRAM and all sorts of stuff. And again, uh, supposedly you can do it from the 68K ROM address of uh, the 68K RAM into VRAM just fine, but I haven't quite got that work to, to work either. So uh, mode set, I'm going to speed it up a little bit here. Uh, mode set one. I have a library that I wrote, so I'm going to reference uh, macros and variables in the library that uh, you can use to set these pretty easily. This is the defined for mode set one. It's register zero, zero. And all I have to do is write to one address to set that because uh, one address for those two addresses to set that because that's how those addresses work. And I'll get into that later. Display enable, uh, start the beam, all sorts of things. Just turn it on, turn it off. Palette select, you want that always to be one pretty much. There's some monochrome funky shit if you have it zero, but I haven't explored that. Uh, so one has color, zero has monochrome. Horizontal interrupts, uh, the Sega Genesis can generate three interrupts, a horizontal interrupt, a vertical interrupt, as well as an external interrupt for the controllers and other such things. Um, and those are on the auto vector interrupt tables if you use the 68K of the 68K. Uh, then we have the rest are zeros. Now those aren't all necessarily zeros. I don't use them. There are, you read the documentation, there are other things, but I don't use them myself. And holy crap, yeah, it doesn't work because the projector sized it differently, so I can't do page down. So, all right. Mode set two. Have that be one. Set it to Genesis. This is for backward compatibility with the master system. Just have it set to one. Pal, have it set to one. This is inverse. I should have wrote pal first, but one equals NTSC. Uh, you can use NTSC. You can use those defines for that. DMA enable. If you want to do DMA, set it to one, because you might accidentally write to the VDP uh, addresses to start DMA. That happens a lot, because the documentation for writing to those really stinks. And it's almost trial and error uh, when you start to do it. So vertical interrupts enable, show display. The first one generated the scan line. This one just blanks the display. Vertical interrupt still goes. 
still pretends like everything is going fine. You just don't see anything. With the first one, with mode set one, turns everything off. Uh, set it to one, backward compatibility. Name table, scroll a base. It's kind of a long to find. I want to shorten these up in the future. Um, you have a register. It's associated with these bits in a 16-bit uh, vector. That vector, uh, the VDP guy that I showed you with the VRAM and all the associated areas, that vector uh, represents where in memory that is going to be. So this is scroll a base. Where do you want that in memory? You can only have it in memory where these bits are valid. You can't have anything below that. So you can have you can't have a fine linear wherever the fuck you want. Uh, but you scroll a that macro and put in an address as you would, and it will convert it to that. Name table window, same thing. Pretty much the same thing. This one, it's mapped a little bit different. So if you want to do it yourself, just keep in mind that it's mapped a little bit different. And again, that's scroll B address. And I'm going to come to me at 9. I haven't burned the CDs yet, but I'll burn everything that I have up here, the demonstrations and everything on a CD, so including the slides and everything. And the video. OK, sprite address, uh, attribute base. Same thing. I'll get into the sprite attribute, attribute base a little bit later. What that area of memory represents. Background color, one of 64 colors. You have 64 colors. You have four palettes of 16. Each sprite can have 16 colors. But each sprite can be selected from one of those palettes. So you don't have true 64-bit color throughout the entire screen at a pixel per pixel level. It's an 8 pixel per 8 pixel level. Um, and you don't have 16 colors either, because color zero is uh, transparent. There's a priority to how the, the Sega Genesis draws pixels. And if it's transparent, it goes to the lower priority thing that needs to be drawn. I'll talk about that. I'll talk about that now. The priority is this. You have a background color. If everything's transparent, it goes to the background color. You have scroll B. If everything's transparent, it goes to scroll B. You have scroll A, it goes to scroll A. You have sprites, it goes to sprites. And then you have another bit associated with each sprite called a priority. If that becomes one, then that is above all of these. So you can have plane B uh, with a priority of one that's over sprites, and so on and so forth. And that's how the priority works. If you read sega.doc, they have four pages devoted to displaying little pictures. No, it's all crap. Just keep that in mind, and it's not that complex. Each counter. Uh, it doesn't generate a vertical, a horizontal interrupt at every scan line. You can have it generate an interrupt at whatever scan line you want. You wanted that. 16 scan lines? Well, it can do it. You just write 16 there. And it generates the interrupt at every 16 scan lines if you want to do something every two sprites or something like that. Mode set three. This, these two bits uh, represent the size of the uh, H scroll, whether it can scroll every cell. The documentation says cell and everything. They mean sprite when they say sp sprite. So every eight pixels, or every line. And I didn't write a macro for, or a mask rather, for every for the screen because that's zero. So zero is the screen. Same thing with the vert vertical scroll. You can do it by screen or two cell. That's one bit. You have two options. External interrupt enable. There you go. Mode set four, uh, the screen can be 40 or 32. Uh, my friend Lewis brought up a very interesting, I, my friend Lewis brought up a very interesting idea of emulating the, Ninten the a Nintendo on the Sega Genesis, which is kind of cool because it can be 32. It, the sizes work out. A lot of stuff works out, so maybe you could. But it could be 40 cells by 32 cells. And I'm going to skip the rest because I'm running a little bit low on my section. So that's pretty much it. 
Let's see what we talk about next. I'm going to go to one of my tools. This is a sprite editor. And it might be full screen with this resolution, so that's good. I'll just go mega. There we are. Uh, it's kind of neat. I had a lot of fun with the GUI. There's a, you can do drop shadows and stuff like that. And I wrote a library for the GUI, so I don't know if you can see the drop shadows, but they're there. And if anyone wants to write me documentation, I would be your best friend forever. Because the documentation just says, fuck this, I don't want to do this at the end. So that would be, that would be very, very helpful. These are the 64 colors. Let's set up a color. This will be green. We'll draw a line. And you can treat it like a frame buffer. You can select what you're drawing on. This is scroll A, and it draws the patterns for you. This is a representation of the VRAM. And patterns are a special thing in VRAM that just starts at zero. That doesn't have a vector associated with it. The patterns just start at zero. That way you can reference them just with the number as opposed to a number and a vector uh, with different things. All sorts of other information. Uh, let's save this. So you can save it in a number of ways. I'm going to save it just as a VRAM binary. And I'm going to save that in temp VRAM. OK, temp VRAM. And we'll go to VRAM. Uh, shoot. Let me look at that uh, for a second here. And this is a cool thing. If you have VRAM dumps uh, from emulators or anything that, like that, you could just load it directly. So you can load up Sonic the Hedgehog, and it'll show it per pixel. I just want to see how long this is, because we're going to write a program for it. It's uh, to A. So that's sprites all go to A, and we're using it defaults to scroll A is at C000. So let me dump those out of the VRAM using our friend DD. And I believe that was AA, was it? No, A00. Pretty sure. A00. Zero zero. Yeah. Sweet. OK, thank you. All right, that's the patterns. Uh, now, E00, zero zero, for a quick reference, is the size of 64 by 64 sprite uh, scroll data. So just, you'll use that a lot if you're dumping things. Um, skip. I've had a problem where I can't type when people are looking at my keyboard. It's kind of weird. So oh, bear with me for a second. Thank you. All right, so that's that. I'm gonna um, R, I'm gonna run length encode them because I have a run length decoder in the library and I just want to use that because it's quick. So pat to pat dot RLE. Oh fuck, I overwrote scroll, so let's write that again. OK, so there's these, those two things. I have a little Perl program uh, to convert those to headers. Uh, constant u8, pat, pat.rle to uh, data.header. Same thing with scroll. OK, uh, for this. Uh, other part, I'm going to actually go to here. No, not there. Um, you know, I don't think we're going to have time to write a program, so I'm not going to write a program. I'm just going to show you a few programs, and I'm going to go through the lines of code. Well, it's kind of boring, but uh, I'll show you on fire because it's a pretty simple program. And you'll see kind of what we're doing there. Oh, fired. And, uh, oh, fired. You'll see what we're doing. Start. Uh, since the 68K is fucking leet, um, you have the user uh, um, stack pointer as an interrupt vector. It's not an interrupt, but it loads it up straight away, and you don't have to set up a stack pointer if you don't leave supervisor mode. And we don't leave supervisor mode in the 68K, in the, in the Sega Genesis, because there's nothing really to secure. As you're not, you're not going to run Linux anytime soon on it. There's no memory management unit or anything like that. We have the auto vectors here. 
Uh, external interrupt, horizontal and vertical. Ink gen bin, this is a special binary. I have tools that on the CD2 to generate that binary. It just has information for what the actual ROM that boots. Uh, it reads that information in a lot of emulators too. Think of it like as an INS header if you write Nintendo stuff. Security shit, jump main. That's it, you don't have to do anything else. This just sets up the auto vector so you can call them. Um, and these are the interrupts. Push shit on, push stuff on stack. Um, jump to a vertical hook, which is a pointer to a function. Vertical hook, horizontal hook, and external hook. So let's go to main. Main's real simple. <laughs> Header for the library, uh, horizontal scroll buffer, uh, because we you have a limited number of writes you can do to VRAM while the thing is drawing on the screen. You have more writes while the thing is on a vertical blank. Uh, but you can do DMA and it's real quick. So that's the quickest way to do it. And you can take advantage of being able to write to more VRAM that way. So we have H scroll in RAM pretty much as told by the compiler. And if you want to come to me, I'll tell you how to set up the compiler and everything like that. Like chips, just make sure everything is zero. No routine, that's a function that does nothing. Uh, gen on fire, that draws a genesis on fire. It's actually part of a demo. I'm not gonna do the demo because I don't feel satisfied with it. So let's make, well, let's go to, no, that's cool because I'll tell you about it later. So this is gen on fire. Set shit up, set the modes, set up where the scroll bases are, C0, that sort of stuff, blah. Write to VRAM, this is a little function, writes run length and code to this address from here, uh, and the size is this. No routine, we have a vertical uh, interrupt. Fill H scroll buffer with a zero. This is a macro that's in main.h. Uh, screen on, that sets up a number of registers to turn on the screen. And I won't get into the rest, I'll just run it but that's how you'd set it up. If you turn the screen on at that point, you would see whatever was you drew on the editor. So I, I don't have time to, to get into it. Uh, make, that a right, make clean, make. Run gen rom dot bin. Now I don't know if this will dump me into kind of a weird mode or anything like that. That's the Genesis on fire. It's waving the uh, H scroll buffer uh, with a sign table and uh, no, 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 not yet. I was just wondering if it's, not, not. You, it rotates the sign buffer, uh, with the sign buffer, the H scroll. This is plane A, this is plane B, this is plane B high, it gets drawn over everything. So you can have that wave, you don't wave that. I'll show you another example here. And actually that loads up another emulator because I have a script just to run like three emulators. I make, thing, make sure things run right. So this one, it's a little bit more complex. I don't know if you've ever seen 3D on the Nintendo. I know there's Virtual Racer, but that used a separate chip in the cartridge to draw polygons. So this is just using software that kind of jiggles and that rotates. And this is a uh, sprites, the scroll B, scroll A, and uh, no, scroll A and then scroll B behind jittering. And the source code for these are gonna be in the little CD. If you come to me at nine, because I don't have it burned yet, but if you come to me at nine, I'll show you. This is kind of like a little mini game. So you can jump over that jump over the keyboard. Oh God, Commander Keen has to jump on those. And Commander Keen turns out to be a dick. You could just set him there and he'll jump forever and score points forever, so. <laughs> Scroll B is in the background. I have kind of a parallax thing because we can control it line by line. That goes slower, that goes faster, that goes faster. And holy shit, that goes a lot more faster than everything else. So, oh, he jumped into the air. That's a bug. You can't <laughs> jump while you're jumping. So. 
It was part of a demo. Like it's, it was very specific. It was going to actually be played out by the demo program. So you wouldn't play it. So it's not full collision detection or anything like that. So I'll show you the data for one of those at least. I'll show you the VAX. And I'll put the source code for the not working demo too. You have a lot of art examples and stuff like that. Uh, so that's the VAX. You can see it all here. These aren't the map that's just on there. I have a separate map. Uh, so that's just so I know where the sprites are and it gets drawn right. So you can scroll each plane individually if you want. There's plane A. And uh, the score doesn't get scrolled. It just stays there. And uh, you get the idea. I know it wasn't really complete, but see how much time I have left here. But uh, now we get into audio and come up to me because if you have questions, I'll let you know. And uh, we should get people uh, running and making programs. And I want to do want to add one thing though before Lewis begins to speak about the audio uh, subsystem. If anyone wants to write a demo, if anyone wants to work on art and work on sound, come to me, uh, preferably before the demo party is over. We'll come up with a demo group name and write a demo. I'll do code for next year. Uh, that way I afford the opportunity to uh, build the tools better and stuff like that for your use. So my friend Lewis, in a minute. Thank you. Hello. Hi. My name is Luis Gonzalez, and I'll be talking about uh, a little bit about how the Genesis Audio works. Plug in the audio source. Let's start that right. Okay. A little background of myself. I have. Um, I'm a third year student at NYU. I have uh, no electronics experience before starting this project. Um, I couldn't tell you the, the negative side to a capacitor. Uh, I started this project about five months ago. Um, so these are my adventures of creating and learning about the, how the Genesis, this little device, how it produces audio, more at the hardware level. And I got interested in um, video game music uh, what video game music are, these little files. I'll start a playlist so you can hear what they sound like. Video game music can represent many things. It could be uh, NSF files, which uh, what you're hearing right now is a Nintendo NSF file. Small 19K file. They're the soundtrack. Uh, some of them contain like the ROM information from the game. Others contain a log file of all the registers sent to the sound chip. Um, there are multiple different formats. The one I was interested in is the VGM, which uh, records the log uh, entries to the Sega Master System and Sega Genesis. Uh, there are other formats too, like the SPC, which is the uh, Super Nintendo. These are very small files. Uh, this one you're hearing is 68, 68K. It's the format similar to like a mod file. And, uh, very popular. But the, for the purpose of this presentation, we're going to be focusing on EGM files, which is what you're hearing right now. Now, EGM files um, actually have the register information for the, uh, both of the audio chips in it. It is also the, uh, the format for the master system, which is an 8-bit version of the, the chip. The 
know, you could get BGM files from the m many sites. Uh, one of them is Project 2612, which has like every Genesis game uh, soundtrack. Um, also, you can get it from SMS Power, which has uh, which created the BGM format and has Master System uh, soundtracks. And what inspired me to uh, research the Genesis audio was all these th projects that I saw online. Uh, the particularly was this NSF player, which is a hardware NSF player. It's like a self-contained circuit that plays back a file. And there was these other projects, like the people playing around with the, the audio chip of the FM chip, the PSG chip, so I thought, why not make a little uh, Walkman-like device that can play VGM files? You heard the Sonic the Hedgehog playing back on this, this player. But it's actually running through an emulator, so some of the things don't sound exactly quite right. So the, I wanted to create a little player that would play back the audio 100% perfectly, and what better way to do that than to use the actual chips. All the information is online. Uh, I have the, uh, the schematics, the, the documentations, the data sheets, the VGM formats all spec'd out. I have all the music files. So all I had to do is just put it together and um, Having no uh, electronics experience uh, th would be quite interesting. So this site, mudocs.org, has all the documentation you need, the schematics, the data sheets for uh, all the sound chips. Uh, when I first uh, looked at this, I had no idea what I was looking at, but it, it looked pretty cool. Um, pinouts for the FM chip, the VGM spec. And what uh, led me to believe that I could do this project is there's this text here that says, YM2640 write value DD to register A. So I, I remember seeing that before. I saw it on this pinout. You see it says uh, write to part A register, write to part two register. It maps to that BGM file format. So I thought there must be a way to get this file directly to this chip. And uh, apparently I was right. So it led me to create this uh, device that streamed the VGM file data to those chips. And in doing so, I learned a lot about uh, how the Genesis creates its sound. And I'll, I'll play back a little sample for you. This circuit took uh, about five months to complete. It's running all from battery power. keep all the VGM information on these little EEPROMs, which are 32, 32K worth of information. So I'll go into the details of how I, uh, what I learned. Uh, we can start with the PSG chip. That's the simplest chip to, to, to learn. Um, it's found in many game consoles, arcade, computers. Uh, what you're seeing here is the Sega 1000. It's also found in the Sega 3000 Mark III. It's also in the Game Gear. It's a very popular chip. It's in the ColecoVision. It's in the Sega Master System, and of course, in the Genesis. So I thought this was a good, good place to start to learn how this chip uh, produces audio, how to get data into it. Um, the data sheet gave me this information, has three square wave tone generators and one white noise generator, which sounds like static. Here's a little sound of the, the chip. This is from Sonic the Hedgehog 2. It's uh, the PSG playing in the background. You hear it so light, you don't notice it. It's very muted, but it's playing in the background of, of Sonic the Hedgehog 2, Emerald Hill Zone. Sounds very similar to Nintendo. So to get sound out of it, you write registers to it. Oops, this playing back. So that's what the PSG sounds like. It sounds for Programmable Sound Generator. It's an integrated circuit with everything you need in it. It has an audio mixer, it has a um, 
built-in oscillators, so all you need to do to get uh, data out of it is write to each of the pins. So how do you do that? See, these boxes represent uh, a channel. This is, represents one of the tone channels. There's three square wave tone channels and a white noise generator. And to access those, you write a binary on, off, on, off, in just one byte to access each of those channels. So depending on what you write to the chip, you can turn off th uh, channel three volume or uh, set the frequency to a higher setting. Um, I'll go into this registers later. How do I know the PSG chip existed inside the Genesis? Well, it was inside the schematic. You can see the PSG chip here and the FM chip here. I didn't know the PSD chip existed until I saw this document. They, they both mix into this uh, circuit. Mono, stereo, mixes into the headphone jack. So I thought this was great. How do I get uh, data into it? Well, the first thing I needed to know is a uh, hex to binary conversion. The image you see on the left in red, that's the VGM file data. That's the instructions uh, in that file that has all the music, register changes you need to do, set the channel on or off. Um, and these pins, uh, you, you remember, remember that pin out has D0 through eight. So just take those uh, hex values, convert them into binary, and just map them to the correct pins. Just dump them like a player piano. How do I do this? Well, there's this tool called Arduino which let me do that very easily. It's a IDE, it's very easy to use. It lets me control this microcontroller, which lets me to use, set, set these pins, digital pins on the top, to on or off very easily. Like you can see in, in the code, digital write pin, set pin six to one. So that's a, the first prototype I did was to stream a, uh, a VGM file through serial port, send it to the Arduino, parse it out into the ones and zeros, and send it to the FM uh, PSG chip. I got this idea from uh, Little Scale, this uh, website that did a similar project. And here's a video of it playing. So from my computer, the VGM file streams to the serial port, USB. So it works. Problem was, I ran out of pins. To implement the VGM uh, player, I'm, I'm gonna need the other FM chip, which has more pins than the PSD chip. Uh, as you can see here, it's all filled up. I don't have any more pins to uh, write data to. So I had to look into shift registers. What shift registers allow you to do is send more data out using uh, fewer wires. So you, you remember the byte example I showed you? You could fill up eight bytes just directly connecting the pins to it. Well, in this example, you take one, one bit and you push it out one at a time. So if you can imagine, I fill it a bit into this box over here and then move it over to six and then push another bit, zero, push it over, and it keeps going, keeps going. Once this is filled, it moves on to the next one. So with like three lines, you could send uh, 16 bits of data. So this is a shift register example that I just used the Arduino examples uh, from. I put a, a zip socket in there. So that's where the uh, FM chip was going to go. And these lights will tell me uh, if I'm streaming the data out correctly. The order matters. I put them in reverse. Um, so these are the shift registers. This is the PSG chip. It sends the data out to this shift register. It fills uh, eight bits here. And then once this is filled, it sends eight bits to there and then it sends another like latch command to tell it to send it out all at once. This means it's gonna send the byte, one byte to the PSG chip and one byte to the FM chip. This is where the FM chip is gonna go. Um, that brings me to the next step, to getting the FM chip. And to do that, 
I had to take one out of a real Genesis. So this is the Genesis I took the Pia FM chip out of. I had to desolder it. And this is a picture of all the steps that I uh, went through to get it. I bought a used Sega Genesis for like $30. Took it apart. Very painful to do. So it was a nice system. Took out all the parts. You can see that's the cartridge port. That's the 68K uh, CPU. This is the chip I needed. All these are like memory chips. So I located it, I desoldered it. I have it in my hand now, straight to the breadboard. Now the, the FM chip works uh, almost the same way as the PSG chip does, and it work, means you could, you could get sound out of it by writing bytes to it. What those bytes do, uh, if you read the documentation, they're different register writes. Um, like we'll take a look at the pinout again. These values D0 through D7, that's where the, the bytes are going to go. And there are other pins that tell you which part of the registers you can write into. Uh, this chip also has an integrated audio mixer, which was convenient. Has stereo out. These are two stereo outs. And uh, these four pins tell, you, tell the chip that it's ready to receive data. If it uh, gives a status if it's ready to receive the next set. This is what a VGM file looks like. Remember the, those hex commands that we needed to send those bytes out to the pins? So now that I know how to send bytes to the uh, IC chips, it's just a matter of uh, parsing through this file. If I encounter a command, like 50 is the command to send a, the, the next byte to the PSG chip, 52 would be uh, a command to send a byte to the FM chip, so on and so forth. What those bytes mean you could read the documentation and kill yourself understanding how the, uh, the channel uh, addresses. But uh, you just pumped it the data. A little overview of how it works. I keep the e uh, VGM data in this EEPROM. Takes it one byte at a time through the Arduino. The Arduino sends it out to the shift registers. If you remember, the shift registers is just containers of one bit at a time so for one byte. So I fill these up. They all have uh, one byte worth of information. This one goes to the PSG chip. This one goes to the FM chip. And these are little control bits that you, you need to tell the, uh, this FM chip that it's ready to receive information, it's ready to write information. Uh, you need to set the clock to low or high. And it um, receives the information serially and then receives a, a latch command to send it all at once. These are oscillators, uh, 3.5 megahertz for the PSG chip, 7.6 megahertz for the FM chip. And I, I told you earlier that the FM chip has an audio out, so does the PSG chip. They all mix into this uh, headphone jack. The bottom right is a little Arduino chip. The, what the headphone jack looks like, a little EEPROM. That's the first prototype. This is the code that was necessary to interpret the uh, VGM data stream. Like when you encounter a, a command, let's say a 53 byte, that means it's going to write port 1 register, register AA, but write the next byte that's next to the 53 uh, byte. Um, so all kinds of uh, resources uh, you can find online to help you understand what the chips are capable of. I went to Project 2612 to download all the VGM files I needed. SMS Power to get the VGM's file spec. Sprites Mind is a forum. Uh, it's an active forum where people actively create uh, Genesis programs or any technical questions or demos or music that, that people create nowadays. There's a Facebook group dedicated to the, y, uh, the FM chip. I thought that was pretty cool. I joined it. 
Um, there are trackers available. Trackers are uh, music creation tools. These output VGM files. Um, it's popular. I think that there's a chiptune community that creates VGM files. There's multiple VGM uh, editors. There's one for the PSG chip, three channels, one square wave. Um, this is another uh, Genesis tracker. Uh, a little player, the, the Winamp plugin that I use came from chipamp.org. It uh, installs a plugin that lets you play back VGM files. And uh, I think that's it. I'll, I'll play back another VGM file of the circuit. You could hear. That's just the PSG chip, no FM. Someone made that for a chiptune composition like two years ago. It's about uh, 20K. I didn't implement all the instructions, all the timing instructions correctly, so it's a little off. You can hot swap it. Last one. This is a song that someone created using those tracker software. It didn't come from a game. Okay. And that's it. That's my circuit, self-contained. <laughs>